Okay, class, we're going to continue our discussion of the Odyssey, this time books five through eight, where we finally get to meet Odysseus, the long-awaited hero. Okay, so here are the goals for today's lecture. So we'll briefly review books one through four, thinking about the journey that Telemachus takes in the Odyssey. We'll check in with the wives of the Trojan War heroes that, um, that feature prominently in the Odyssey. This will be a way of discussing Penelope and um, her character arc and her um, the values that she represents in the story. Then finally, we'll introduce Odysseus, the man, not just the myth now. You know, up, to, up until book five, we only hear stories about Odysseus. We don't actually get to meet him, but we finally do meet him in book five. Um, <clears throat> then we'll kind of pay close attention to some textual clues to determine why he even wants to go home in the first place. Homer is very clear that Odysseus has several other romantic options besides Penelope. Why does Odysseus want to go home? Um, then I'll give you some tips for getting through books 9 through 13. These are the books uh, about Odysseus's journeys um, where he gets blown off course. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> um, this uh, sort of tip is, it will be very familiar to you. Um, you know, what does it mean to be a Greek man? Uh, a man needs to be less than divine, but more than animal. Uh, this is going to be very familiar to you guys, having read the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, but this is sort of a specific thing that Greeks need to learn. Uh, you need to learn how to remember the past and honor it, but also avoid getting mired in the past. You need to move on a little bit. You need to learn to how to anticipate the future, too. So um, I'll give you... A uh, little tip for that. Okay, all right, so here's a review of the sort of father-son theme in the Odyssey relative to Telemachus's journey. So um, this is a slide from last time. It's presented as a problem for Telemachus in the epic, and also, by extension, a problem for the Greeks, that these uh, past heroes are, like, better than the present ones. So for Telemachus, it's like his uh, father's generation is more interesting, heroic, powerful, manly, etc. Than, than he will be able to, to be. And this is largely kind of the legacy of Troy. You know, uh, the Trojan War was such a monumental conflict where so many heroes died and so many heroes were valiant and everything. But there's never going to be a war like that again, um, at least for the, the Greeks in myth. <laughs> <clears throat> so here's the line from Athena. It is rare for sons to be like fathers. Only a few are better. Most are worse. And this is sort of Telemachus's journey. How does he come to know himself and come to know his father with this sort of anticipation that he'll never really be as good as his dad? Um, I'll remind you of these lines, too. Um, this is him kind of thinking about his relationship to his father and specifically his father's absence. He says to Athena, who's disguised as mentor, or sorry, Mentes, a mentor. He says, dear guest, I will be frank with you. My mother says that I am his son, but I cannot be sure since no one knows his own begetting. I wish I were the son of someone lucky who could grow old at home with all his wealth. Instead, the most unlucky man alive is said to be my father, since you ask. So it's said that he's my father, but he's not sure who his father is. Like he knows who he is for the most part. He knows his mother's probably not lying. She says he's... Odysseus' son, but he doesn't really know where he comes from because he doesn't really know his father. His father hasn't been around. <clears throat> so how does he come to know his father? Well, he does so in a very interesting way. Homer sends Telemachus on a journey himself. The Odyssey as a whole is largely considered, you know, Odysseus' journey. Um, you can, this is from, a, someone made a Google map roughly corresponding to the places in the journey. Um, the green is where Odysseus uh, journeys. So he starts off in Troy over here in modern day Turkey. You know, whatever. We'll be able to read about all of his, his um, adventures in books 9 through 13. But he gets blown really far off course. You know, o Ithaca is um, over here. Wait, no. Yeah, I think it's here. Yeah, Ithaca's over here. This is Ithaca. So Odysseus had a far way to go. He, you know, some like Sparta and Athens are like closer on this edge. So like Menelaus and Agamemnon had an easier journey home. 
Odysseus, his, his journey was always going to be a little bit harder because he had to go, he has to go all the way around here to Ithaca. <clears throat> but um, th this is crazy. Like, whoo, he gets blown way off course and then he, you know, spins forever away. Um, so, but even though Odysseus has this crazy journey, Telemachus gets his own little journey too. Like he starts off in Ithaca. He's, his is the blue line here, if you can see that. Um, starts off in Ithaca. He goes to Nestor's house in Pylos and then he goes to Sparta to visit Menelaus. And then he goes back home. Um, but he, so he gets his own little kind of journey. So you might be asking, you know, like, why is it necessary for Telemachus to go on a journey too? Um, in a way, it kind of brings him closer to his father. Oh, that should be starts. Starts in Ithaca, to Pylos with Nestor, to Sparta, to see Menelaus. Why does he need to go on a journey? It gets him kind of close to the mindset of his father a little bit. It maybe gets him close to, um... Uh, the mindset of a Greek hero. You know, maybe it's important for these Greeks to kind of go away from home. You know, often, this is why students go away to college usually. Like, you learn more if you're outside of your house. <laughs> you know, there's only so much your parents can teach you. You really need to expose yourself to outside perspectives, different values, different cultures, you know, different ways of being. And figure out what works for you before um, you can uh, really come to know what was good about your home, like what was working, what wasn't, and, and if you want to reaffirm those values or not. So anyway, Telemachus goes on kind of a little mini journey. In fact, um, some scholars refer to books one through four of the Odyssey as uh, the Telemachy, you know, like Odyssey is to Odysseus, Telemachy is to Telemachus. So he gets his own little journey too, which is nice. There's probably other reasons. Um, this might be something you, th you think about, like why exactly does Telemachus need to go on this, this journey? Um, there's probably other reasons going on too. So feel free to bring any of those up. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay. So um, one thing that Telemachus learns on the journey, like he learns, you know, how he, how to survive away from home, how to be independent, no longer under his mother's control which is important for a young man, apparently, especially a young Greek man. But he also gets to learn a lot about um, marital relationships. <laughs> um, so just to remind you of uh, some of the other Nosto stories that the Greeks had. So Agamemnon, the major player in the Iliad, the most powerful king, he does get to journey home, and he kind of has this sort of, sort of glorious homecoming at first. It seems really great. But that's not the end of the story. So this is um, from last time, Menelaus describing what happens to his brother Agamemnon. So while Menelaus was wandering, accumulating wealth, someone crept in and killed my brother. His own scheming wife betrayed him. I take no joy in all my wealth, whatever. And he goes on to say, to imply that, I, I talked about this last time, he goes on to imply that he wishes that he stayed here. Menelaus wishes he stayed in Sparta and didn't go to war, didn't go get Helen back. Um, this is very interesting. When Menelaus describes what happened to his brother, he focuses all of the attention on the wife involved. And then over here, he's thinking about his own wife. I wish I had stayed here. I would have paid, you know, all those who died at Troy. I wish they were all alive and well. You know, I would have given that except for, you know, instead of um, getting my wife back. So Menelaus seems to be very critical of his own wife and maybe wives in general. You know, how he's framing wives in this speech is that they're very treacherous. They're scheming. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty bad. Um, you'll, you might compare this, this description of what happens to Agamemnon to the one that we saw earlier where Athena tells Telemachus... To be a good son, like Orestes, he avenges his father's murderer. Which, uh, and then Athena mostly focuses on Aegisthus, the the male figure of the adulterous union. But Menelaus is more concerned with wives. And fair enough, his wife is Helen, Helen of Troy, um, famously called Helen of Troy, even though she should be referred to as Helen of Sparta because, you know, she's the queen of Sparta, Menelaus's wife. Um, okay, I want to talk about this painting first. This, it was, it's a painting on a, um, 
on a like a pot, like some sort of vessel. This is a depiction of, of Helen here and Menelaus. And then over here, um, Aphrodite is the goddess depicted here with, you can tell it's Aphrodite because, you know, if any, any time a woman is hanging out with like a little baby, a little baby angel thing, <laughs> that's um, Aphrodite and her son Eros, um, uh, or, or Cupid, you might know him better as. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing that Aphrodite, in some versions of the myth, her son is Eros, but if you recall from Hesiod, Eros was one of the four primary gods of the universe. Eros meaning um, the sort of erotic drive of love of, or lust. And Aphrodite is the goddess of love, of course. So remember, um, Aphrodite in the Trojan War conflict, she really loved um, Paris because he chose his heart over other concerns, over wisdom, over glory even. Um, Aphrodite also really loves Helen because Helen is beautiful. Aphrodite is the goddess of love. Of course she would like a beautiful woman. This depiction on this pot is really interesting. Um, as you look at it, uh, you'll, so pay, uh, one thing to note here, Menelaus is approaching Helen in his armor. He's got a shield, he's got his war helmet. Where's his sword? Well, it's not in his hand anymore. It, the sort of implication is that on seeing Helen, Menelaus wanted to attack her. He wanted to go to war against this woman who hurt him and cheated on him. But when he sees her beauty, beautiful face, he's like literally disarmed. His armor, his, his sword falls from his hand. So like if you were Sigmund Freud, you'd be like, that's castration, you know, his like, you know, phallic symbol of the sword falls. Um, his power is diminished. His masculine power is diminished in the face of feminine beauty. That's maybe what Freud might say. Um, but I find it really, really interesting that like the power of Helen's beauty is such that it makes people act in ways that are against their intention. You know, Menelaus is justifiably angry at Helen. He wants to attack her, but when he sees her face, he cannot. And so I have a lot of sympathy for Menelaus in this situation, but I also have a lot of sympathy for Helen. You know, what would it be like to be so beautiful that people can't even have natural reactions to you? You know, your, your beauty is so awe-inspiring and powerful that, you know, it's like, like cosmic or something in a way. Um, Helen uh, is the daughter of Zeus and a mortal woman. Um, she's also the sister of Clytemnestra, funnily enough. So Agamemnon, Menelaus are brothers. They marry a pair of sisters who are um, quasi-divine. They're the daughters of Zeus and a mortal woman, um, Leda is her name. Zeus rapes her when he turns into a swan. So anyway, this is all just sort of part of the myth. But um, anyway, I just wanted to kind of like point that out that like Helen is a really, really interesting figure. Um, this is from last time as well. I think I talked about this. Menelaus uh, vows to stop crying, um, crying over Troy. And then H Helen steps in and drugs everyone. She mixes the wine with drugs to take all pain and rage away to bring forgetfulness of every evil. You know, this is such a, such a, such a compassionate move on her part. You know, on one hand, it's compassionate. She doesn't want the people around her to suffer anymore. You know, maybe she feels responsible for that suffering. Um, and she doesn't, you know, she just doesn't want people crying any longer. You know, this is so sad. On the other hand, you could read it, interpret it as very um, manipulative. You know, maybe she doesn't want people crying because... If they think too much about how sad Troy was, they might start to blame her, you know, because, um, you know, Aphrodite made her go crazy, as she says in our translation, um, and leave her husband, or perhaps she was taken from her husband. Anyway, this is all just to point out, like, how important wives are in this situation. The wife of Menelaus was basically the start of the Trojan War, um, her, her being abducted, or her willingly choosing to leave her husband, depending on how you would interpret her move to Troy. Okay. Um, and then to remind you again, this is from last time as well, we have uh, these very inter interesting stories that Menelaus and, Bo and Helen tell Telemachus about his father. 
So we learn a little bit about Odysseus through this, uh, through these stories, but Telemachus also learns a little bit about the relationship between husband and wife in these stories too. Excuse me. So um, Helen uh, tells this story of Odysseus, you know, how clever he is, um, but also in her story, she seems to Im embed this sense that she is very sorry for what happened. Uh, the Trojan women keened in grief when um, Odysseus slaughters some Trojans, but I was glad. By then I wanted to go home. I wished that Aphrodite had not made me go crazy when she took me from my country and made me leave my daughter in the bed I shared with my fine, handsome, clever husband. You know, we see here that um, this is a woman who seems rather afraid of her husband. You know, she seems like she wants to butter him up to make him feel valued. Um, or maybe you see her as manipulative here. Like maybe she's just trying to, um, you know, make him feel, <laughs> feel seen or feel um, valued. And it's actually very um, calculated, maybe. So anyway, certainly different motivations might strike you for Helen here. Um, then Menelaus tells the story of Odysseus that also is another story of how to view Helen. Menelaus says, you know, yes, wife, quite right. I've been around the world. I've seen many heroic men, known their minds. I never saw a man so resolute as that of Odysseus. So this seems like it's going to be a story about how wonderful and smart and resolute Odysseus is and tough. And it sort of is that story. Um, but also the story reveals a lot about Helen. So um, this is a story of when the men were hiding inside the Trojan horse. Uh, by the way, this is a, a more contemporary image where the men are literally hiding inside the horse. This is from the movie Troy. Anyway, the guys are hanging out on the horse, being very, very quiet, so to trick the Trojans. Um, Helen comes outside of the horse, and a spirit who desired to glorify the Trojans urged Helen on, according to Menelaus. Three times, Helen is walking around the hollow belly of the horse, touching the hiding place, calling on us Greeks by name. So this is very interesting. Menelaus is implying that Helen knows that this is a trick. And she's trying to, you know, force the Greeks to reveal themselves so that their plan will be foiled. Um, okay, so Helen also comes across as very supernatural here. So Helen put on different voices for each man's wife. This means that she's like um, ventriloquizing or imitating the wives of the men who are inside the horse. So think of these men in the horse, like they've, it's been almost, you know, 10 years where before they've, or 10 years since they've seen their wives and heard their wives. Like, you know, if you've ever gone a long time before hearing someone's voice, like when you do hear that voice that you remember and you love that person, that would be so difficult not to reveal yourself in the, in the horse. But so this is Helen trying to catch the men out. Um, I and Diomedes and good Odysseus inside the horse heard you call out to us, and we too wanted to go out or to answer for in for, from in there. Um, Odysseus has prevented us from going. So Odysseus is very resolute. You know, this is the word he uses. He's so strong. He can defy temptation, um, even when it's like at, it, at its most tempting. Um, he even has to clamp shut the mouth of this other man until Athena led you far away. So... Um, some spirit urged her on, and then Athena, the goddess of wartime strategy, leads Helen away. So yeah, we get a very, very different view of Helen here. Like, it seems in this story that she wanted the Trojans to have more glory. You know, maybe she doesn't want to go home to Menelaus here. Very tricky how to view Helen in these very kind of conflicting stories. So, Telemachus is learning a lot. This He's basically seeing a husband and wife have kind of a public, uh, have a very tense dinner party. And they're telling stories where it's revealed maybe that they're not really, um, they're not really newlyweds anymore. They're not really like so in love that they'll forgive everything, you know, anyway. So this is kind of a way for us as readers and maybe for Telemachus as well to think about his mother, Penelope. Um, they have a very interesting interchange in, um, I think it's the end of book one, or perhaps two. Yeah, I think it's the end of book two, 
um, where Telemachus tells his mother to be quiet and go upstairs. <laughs> and this is, I think it's meant to just demonstrate that he's like manly now. He's like the man of the house and he can tell his mother what to do. And she listens to him. She does go up back upstairs. Penelope is a really interesting character in the ancient world. In the epic, you'll note that we don't get to see very much of her. She doesn't get to talk very much. However, um, I'm going to kind of demonstrate, I think, in the rest of this lecture that she is so important to this epic. Um, here's, here's an image of Penelope. She's often depicted in this way with her legs crossed. Um, you know, I'm not sure if these days if a woman crosses her legs, we're thinking that she's very chaste, but that's what the ancient Greeks thought. Like, she's literally closing her legs, you know, keeping them closed. So this is sort of her her symbology, her, her symbolism as um, a woman who knows how to be faithful sexually. And she's not going to have sex with just anybody. Okay, so um, here's kind of a, a moment where we learn a lot about Penelope through the words of another person. So one of the suitors, um, these are young men who are trying to get Penelope to marry them. Um, one of the suitors starts yelling at Telemachus. Okay, so she says, Telemachus, you stuck up, willful little boy. How dare you try to embarrass us and put the blame on us? We suitors have not done you wrong. Go blame your precious mother. She is cunning. It is the third year, soon it will be four, that she has cheated us of what we want. She offers hope to all, sends signs to each, but all the while her mind moves somewhere else. She came up with a special trick. She fixed a mighty loom inside the palace hall. Weaving her fine, long cloth, she said to us, Young men, you are my suitors. Since my husband, the brave Odysseus, is dead, I know you want to marry me. You must be patient. I have worked hard to weave this winding sheet to... Uh, Sorry, it should be to bury. To bury good Laertes when he dies. Laertes is Odysseus's father. He gained such wealth, the women would reproach me if he were buried with no shroud. Please let me finish it. And her words made sense to us. So every day she wove the mighty cloth. Then at night, by torchlight, she unwove it. For three long years, her trick beguiled the Greeks. But when the fourth year's season rolled around, a woman slave who knew the truth told us. We caught her there, unraveling the cloth, and made her finish it. So this is the very famous story of Penelope at her loom. She weaves it. She's weaving a funeral shroud. A shroud is like, um, it's kind of like a, a ceremonial blanket that you put over a dead body. So she's weaving this ceremonial uh, blanket for her husband's father. So she's a really good daughter-in-law. Um, and then, but at, by night, she's unweaving it. So she's undoing the work that she does by day. So by day, she's a dutiful daughter-in-law. And she also seems to be um, offering hope to the suitors. She's like, just let me finish the shroud, guys, and then I'll marry one of you. So she seems like that's what she's doing. But she is cunning. This is a really, really crafty ruse to keep the suitors from knowing really what she's about, you know? Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's actually very cunning, right? Like, she, she's cheating them of what they want. Um, she, like, ostensibly, like, on the surface, she seems to be fulfilling all of these, like, wifely duties or, like, feminine duties. You know, she's giving these guys hope. Um, she's kind of, like, in, in a way it might be sort of seen as, like, it's not really flirting, but it's, like, it's giving them hope. Like, it's, it's like, she's, she's such a dutiful wife. Wow. I want to marry a woman that, that has such obligations to her father-in-law. Wow. What a great, you know, wife that would be. Um, notice also that, you know, her, her brand of flirting is very like, um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's very virtuous. Like she's like weaving, <laughs> you know, um, sorry. Um, she's weaving like, uh, you know, not only is weaving sort of like this tool of, of Athena, this, this uh, symbol of wisdom, um, but it's also a symbol of like, you know, women's work in a way that like is very suitable and appropriate for like ancient values usually. You know, you might think of the, the weaver girl here. Um, it's usually weavers are not seen as, um, I don't know, rocking the boat or anything. Like they're not, you know, going to run for president or something like that or go to medical school. They're just weaving like women tend to do in these ancient cultures. Um, anyway, 
Uh, yeah. So anyway, so this is what she's doing, and it kind of works for three years. <laughs> so she's been fooling the suitors for this long. Um, so the seeds are already planted for thinking about Penelope as a very wise woman. You know, cunning, crafty, not only literally crafty, but like kind of tied to um, the the vo sort of um, craft of, of, of the most crafty goddess there is, which is Athena. You know, as a, as a weaver. Um, so anyway, uh, stay tuned to, to hear more about Penelope. Um, we finally get to hear more of her talking towards the end of the epic when um, she's reconciled with her husband. And that's sort of a spoiler. It takes a long time for that reconciliation to happen because she is so cunning and crafty and cautious. Okay. I'll keep going. Okay. Now, in books five, we finally meet Odysseus. It's, like, amazing. So, um, here it is. You've been waiting for it. You probably are expecting something like this. You know, these are some images of Odysseus throughout the ages. Um, here's a mosaic. This is, uh, I think that's... Is that Eric Bana? What's that guy's name? Sean Bean. Sean Bean from, um, Troy played <laughs> Odysseus. Sean Bean, you might know from, uh, Game of Thrones. I think he's Ned Stark or something. Anyway. So these are, um, you know, like a bust, Roman mosaic, Sean Bean, you know, kind of windswept. He seems kind of rough a little bit. I suppose handsome, perhaps. Okay. This is what we might expect, you know, a hero, but this is what we get in book five. Uh, Hermes is sent down by Zeus to find Odysseus at, in Calypso's island. Hermes did not find Odysseus in Calypso's cave, since he was sitting by the shore as usual, sobbing in grief, grief and pain. His heart was breaking, in tears... He stared across the fruitless sea. Yeah, our great war hero is sitting on the beach crying. He's sobbing. He's completely hopeless, he seems. This is quite a, a um, letdown of our expectations for our hero. Um, Homer's even worse later. In book six, Odysseus, once he leaves Calypso's island, Calypso helps him. Eventually she lets him go. And she sets him up, she, you know, anoints him with oil, she dresses him really well, she gives him a raft. But Poseidon is mad at Odysseus. Um, he encounters, like, a shipwreck. Uh, he's, uh, Poseidon makes Odysseus wreck his, his little raft. Um, Odysseus almost drowns. And um, when he finally washes up on shore of the Phaeacians um, island, he's naked. <laughs> so here he is in book six, nearly dead, completely naked. Uh, he scares a group of young women who are doing their laundry. Okay, so Odysseus jumped up from out of the bushes. Grasping a leafy branch, he broke it off to cover up his manly private parts. Just as a mountain lion trusts its strength and beaten by the rain and wind, its eyes burn bright as it attacks the cows or sheep or wild deer, and hunger drives it on to try the sturdy pins of sheep. So need impelled Odysseus to come upon the girls with pretty hair, though he was naked. All caked with salt, he looked a dreadful sight. They, the girls, they ran along the shore, quite terrified, some here, some there. So if you identify with the girls in this situation, this would be pretty horrifying. Like you're just trying to do your laundry, you want some privacy. All of a sudden, this middle-aged man is naked and like jumping up from out of the bushes, completely naked with like a branch. This is kind of scary. But from Odysseus's perspective, he's nearly dead here. Like he is driven by need. As this simile points out, um, need impelled Odysseus to come upon the girls with pretty hair. He literally almost dies on this um, in this shipwreck. He needs their help. Um, he has to come upon them, and so he's he's quite um, he's quite embarrassed by what he has to do. You know, approaching them naked. And I'm um, actually book six uh, goes on. It's rather interesting. Like um, knowing that he's naked, he. He doesn't go straight up to the young women to ask for help. He supplicates them from afar. He like Greeks, uh, Greeks um, when they're asking for help and for mercy, they have this very conventional pose where they kneel at someone's um, knee, they kneel at someone's feet and they touch their face with their hands um, and they like beg them for help. That's the very common way to ask for help in ancient ancient Greece. Um, Odysseus, knowing that he's naked and these are young women, that would be very scary for them. 
he doesn't do that. So he's, he hangs back and asks for help from afar, which is, you know, actually pretty smart, um, you know, as to not uh, scare them. Okay, anyway, I just had a flash. There is a, this is potential connection with um, the cowherd in Weaver Girl myth. There's also a, a scene where, or in some versions of the myth, where the cowherd comes upon the Weaver Girl when she's bathing naked. And so there's this kind of interesting idea in the ancient world with coming upon um, someone when they're most vulnerable, when they're naked and um, trying to get clean. Okay. All right, so even though Odysseus is hardly, um, hardly like respectable when we first see him in book five, he's crying and or naked and almost dead. He cleans up really nice. Uh, so anyway, he's still really attractive. So just to remind you of his age at this point, um, when he goes off to Troy, he was probably in his 20s, I guess. You know, he's at his youngest, he'd, he'd likely be in his 20s, maybe even in his 30s when um, he sails for the Trojan War. It's been 20 years since then. So... He's probably in his 40s, maybe even 50s. So he's kind of like this older older guy, you know, maybe, I mean, middle age, maybe, potentially. He's really attractive, however. So he's so attractive that Calypso, the goddess, wanted to make him immortal. Um, here's some lines kind of proving this point. Um, uh, Hermes comes down to tell Calypso to let Odysseus go home. She's angry. She says, you cru cruel, jealous gods, you bear a grudge whenever any goddess takes a man to sleep as a lover in her bed. This man, Odysseus, alone, was swept by wind and wave and came here to my home. I cared for him and loved him, and I vowed to set him free from time and death forever. So um, Calypso's angry. You know, usually gods in the Greek universe are allowed to sleep with whoever they want. Um but she's pointing out that it's it's kind of rare for goddesses to get what they would lo like like with um, mortal men. Um, you can, might compare Calypso here to Ishtar. Ishtar, who was so angry um, that Gilgamesh turns her down. Uh, but Calypso offers something that Ishtar did not offer in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Calypso offers Odysseus immortality. She vowed to set him free from time and death forever. Calypso loves Odysseus. She loves him so much that she's willing to risk immortality on him. You know? Uh, that's love, man, you know? <laughs> um, if I lived forever, I'm not sure I'd want to have an immortal partner, you know? Wouldn't you get tired of each other? You live forever. But Calypso loves this man enough that she, she knows she's going to love him forever. It's kind of beautiful, you know. Um, okay, so Calypso loves Odysseus that much. Apparently he's attractive, or he's just such an attractive um, partner, like he's amazing and good to talk to or something. Um, Nausicaa is uh, the princess who was doing her laundry. So she's a very young woman, um, and she is mortal. She's a human. She also sees Odysseus and thinks of him as potential husband material. She has this really cute aside when she speaks to her um, servant girls. She says, listen to me, girls. The gods who live on Mount Olympus must have wished this man to come in contact with my godlike people. Before, he looked so poor and unrefined. Now he is like a god that lives in heaven. I hope I get a man like this as husband, a man who lives here and would like to stay. But girls, now give the stranger food and drink. So yeah, she's, you know, being very, very cute, very young. Um, and uh, recall that this is the man who scared her because he was naked and so, um, you know, so almost dead that he was kind of horrifying. But now he's like a god that lives in heaven. And she hopes for a husband like this. Exciting. So Odysseus has options here. So let's talk about those options. Why doesn't Odysseus stay with Calypso. Here is when Calypso kind of asks him that question. <laughs> Calypso, again, she's a goddess. Like, goddesses are beautiful, and they're beautiful forever. They're like, you know, think of the most beautiful woman you can picture, and then think of that person remaining that level of attractive forever. This is a goddess, right? Okay, so... Calypso offers immortality to Odysseus, immortality with her. Why does he turn her down? 
Odysseus, son of Laertes, blessed by Zeus, your plans are always changing. Do you really want to go back to that home you love so much? Well then, goodbye. But if you understood how glutted you will be with suffering before you reach your home, you would stay here with me and be immortal, though you might still wish to see that wife you always pine for. And anyway, I know my body is better than hers is. I am taller too. Mortals can never rival the immortals in beauty. So um, Calypso, you know, she makes some good points and she also makes some kind of petty points. Like, obviously she's um, a little bit self-absorbed, you know, pointing out that she's hotter than Penelope. <laughs> Mortals can never rival the immortals in beauty. Sure, that that's true. But she does make some great points. Um, she is right that Odysseus, his plans are always changing. Remember that um, he's the polytropic man. He's many-sided. Um, he changes his mind a lot. Um, if you probably have seen this already as you've been reading. Um, part of the reason maybe that he's taken so long to go home is that his mind is always changing. And so she asks him, do you really want to go back to the home you love so much? You know, if you really wanted to go back, why aren't you there now? That's sort of the question. Um, she also warns him that if he does go home, or if he does choose to go home, he'll be glutted with suffering, which is very true. Um, once he leaves Calypso's island, uh, he nearly dies. So anyway, why not stay with Calypso? Well, this is what Odysseus tells her. So um, Calypso, for, just so you know, um, she's been kind of taken up uh, in the sort of in art history and also in a lot of other works of literature that are more contemporary than the Odyssey, um, because she is quite relatable. You know, like um, a woman who is in love with someone who doesn't quite love her back. You know, this is something that uh, that a lot of artists find a lot they find very compelling. So here's here's one image kind of depicting their relationship. You know, she has everything that you think that you would want. Why doesn't he want her? Okay, Odysseus with tact. So Calypso asks, why don't you stay with me? Odysseus answers with tact. He said, do not be enraged at me, great goddess. You are quite right. I know my modest wife, Penelope, can never match your beauty. She is human. You are deathless, ageless. But even so, I want to go back home. And every day, I hope that day will come. If some god strikes me on the wine-dark sea, I will endure it. By now I am used to suffering. I have gone through so much at sea and in the war. Let this come too. This is a very interesting answer to him, to her. Um, he, note how tactful he is. It's hard to say no to a goddess. Remember Gilgamesh, when he turns Ishtar down, she goes crazy, she goes to her father, gets the bull of heaven, she tries to kill him. <laughs> so there's the potential here for Calypso to be very, very angry with Odysseus when, when he rejects her. Um, but notice how kind he is. Don't be enraged at me. I know you're not as you're you're much more beautiful than my modest wife. So, it's it's not that uh, he's turning her down because he thinks his wife is hotter than her or be more beautiful. You know, it's not that. It's it's hard to say what he really wants. Um, he, she is human. You are deathless, ageless. Even so, I want to go back home. He wants home. Every day I hope that day will come. He has desires, he has hopes. And they seem to be in some ways tied to the fact that Penelope is human. And, um, yeah. In some ways, it's kind of like Odysseus is choosing humanity over divinity. I mean, literally, that is what he's doing. But he's choosing the humanity that Penelope represents as opposed to the deathless, ageless beauty that Calypso represents. Um, by choosing humanity, he's choosing stuff like hope, he's choosing stuff like home, um, he's choosing suffering in that way too. So, anyway, keep this in mind. This is kind of an interesting response. We'll come back to this, this these lines here. Like, what is it that, that Odysseus is choosing when he chooses to go back home? Okay, now, Nausicaa, the princess of the Phaeacian, um, of the Phaeacian uh, community, she offers another temptation to Odysseus, you know. So she liked him, she thought he was cute, uh, you know, she thought, you know, she wishes she could have a husband like him. Here's some lines that I sort of uh, excerpted. So note as I read, there's going to be some Zinnia issues going on. Um, Alcinus, that is Nausicaa's father, he's the king of Phaeacia. 
Alcina said, just one of these things that my daughter did was not correct. She should have brought you here to us ourselves, escorted by her slave girls, since you had supplicated first to her. So Alcinus is um, kind of reprimanding her, his daughter by saying, why didn't you bring Odysseus straight here? But actually, uh, Nausicaa was um, actually being very smart. If she had brought this naked man <laughs> to her father's kingdom, that might not have looked very good. Uh, she did clothe him, um, but he, she clothed him in clothes that she had. So that might not have looked very... Uh, um, that, might not, that might have given people reason to gossip if she escorted this man herself. But that's what her father seems to be annoyed about here. And then notice Odysseus is being tactful here as well. With careful tact, Odysseus replied, Your daughter is quite wonderful, great king. Please do not blame her. She told me to come here with her slaves, but I was too embarrassed and nervous. I thought you might get annoyed at seeing me. We humans on this earth are apt to be suspicious. So Odysseus is lying here. He says that it was his fault that he didn't come with Nausicaa. Actually, Nausicaa made the choice not to have him follow her. But um, this is just, just illustrative of Odysseus's tact. Um, he just knows how to handle social situations. Um, and his, his words uh, endear him to King Alcinous. The king who replied, My heart is not the type to feel anger for no good reason. Moderation is always best. Athena, Zeus, Apollo, what a congenial man you are. I wish you would stay here and marry my own daughter. Be my son. I would give you a home and wealth if you would like to stay. If not, we will not keep you here against your will. So the Zinnia issues are the fact that the king basically almost, you know, he offers his daughter in marriage to this man who he hasn't really met yet. This is before Odysseus has told Elsinus his name. So anyway, Odysseus has made such a great impression that um, the king is sort of offering his daughter <laughs> in, you know, to, to this stranger. Very interesting. Okay, so this is great. This is great for Odysseus. Why doesn't he stay with them? He's made a wonderful impression. He's got this you know, pretty young princess who thinks he's cute. He's got this king who's powerful, who thinks he's a great guy and wants him to be his son. This is awesome. Why would Odysseus not want to be you here? Why, 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 why go home when you have this option? This is what Odysseus tells the Phaeacians. He says, Divine Calypso held me in her cave, wanting to marry me. And likewise, Circe, we haven't met her yet, but we will. Likewise, Circe, this trickster, trapped me, and she wanted me to be her husband. But she never swayed my heart, since when a man is far from home, living abroad, there is no sweeter thing than his own native land and family. So again, even despite these temptations of goddesses and beautiful Nausicaa, Odysseus is choosing home. Notice here that he's tactful. He doesn't mention Penelope. He just mentions home. Kind of interesting. Okay, so if this is true, if he loves home so much, why does it take him 10 years to get home is the question. Okay, um, one other thing that I'm going to draw out a little bit with Nausicaa. So with um, Calypso, she what she is offering is deathless ageless beauty. She offers Odysseus the opportunity to get outside of time, um, to never age, to never suffer, to never die. This is amazing. He turns that down. What does Nausicaa offer? She's young, she's pretty, she's powerful, she's a princess. <laughs> Another thing she offers that you might not think of because you guys are young, but think of, um, I talked about how old Odysseus is likely in his 40s, maybe 50s. How old do you think Penelope is? She probably, you know, even if she had Telemachus in her, you know, if she's a teenager when she had him, um, it's 20 years since then. So she's like, you know, at, you know, maybe she's 38 or something. She's probably coming into her 40s. Um, in a time when a lot of people had a lot of children, this would matter to an ancient Greek that Penelope um, has missed out on a lot of her, her years where she can have, um, uh, where she can most healthily have babies, you know, to put it that way. Um, there's a possibility that Odysseus will come home and they might not be able to have children any longer. Um, Nausicaa, however, is a young girl. Um, you know, she offers the chance for Odysseus to start again. 
you know, he's an older man, you, you know, it's a big age difference and everything, but um, especially in like a time like this, this would have been potentially a suitable match, you know, between this young girl and this, this war hero. So anyway, that's what these ladies represent for him, kind of like the opposite spectrum, and two opposing things that, that point out what Penelope lacks. You know, she, she isn't immortal, and she is no longer young. So therefore, why, why does Odysseus um, choose, choose her over these other options? Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. You know, this might be something you, you write about in your, your discussion, but I'll stop there with this theme. And so here's my sort of tip for getting through the stories in books 9 through 13. There's a lot of stories, a lot of different adventures. Um, but I think what Homer is trying to do is tell these stories about what it means to be a man in the Greek universe. So he's refining the idea of manhood for Greeks. And um, so I have this these two sort of spectrums, um, one temporal and one hierarchical. So the hierarchical one should be familiar to you. Um, I, I did it vertical because um, this makes more sense to me. I've since learned that it might not make sense <laughs> in different cultures, but higher, like in terms of hierarchy, if we think of like heaven above and then like animals below. So Odysseus is in danger in some of the stories of becoming more than a man. You know, he's offered immortality or maybe his ego is kind of too, too big. You know, he's becoming too self-absorbed or something like that. Um, he's some, in some other stories, he or his men are in danger of becoming less than human, less than a man. Um, sometimes literally turning into animals. Um, so that's one of the spectrums that you should think about, like where does the story lie? And then um, other stories have lessons about the dangers of not remembering the past well enough. You know, um, a lot of stories about drug use or um, just falling asleep, that kind of thing. Uh, so not being conscious of um, where you are. And then also not anticipating the future. So um, I put it on this sort of temporal uh, spectrum here, just because um, usually timelines, at least in the Western tradition, start early and go later this way. Um, I'm learning Chinese and apparently, you know, temporally makes more sense to go this way. But anyway, this is all just a schematic anyway. But um, just so think about uh, a temporal kind of lessons about time and how to manage time. Um, and then lessons about uh, hierarchy and where humans fall in the hierarchy. And there's, there might be some connections between these things. Like, you know, if you're, a, if you're a god, you kind of get outside of time in a way. If you're an animal, you might too. Um, so anyway, homework for next time. Please read books 9 through 13. Uh, remember, assignment 2 is due by the end of day, October 29th in Shanghai. So um, yeah, I'll end it there.